Episode 143 of Australia's number one marketing show. Listen into this fireside chat I have with a fellow who started a small business that became, wait for it, the third fastest growing company in Australia with a lazy revenue growth of 678%. Welcome to the Small Business Big Marketing Show, where successful small business owners share their secrets to take your marketing to the next level. Now, here's your host, Tim Reid. G'day, everyone, and welcome back to Small Business Big Marketing. I am your host, Timbo Reid. You, however, are a very, very motivated small business owner who wants to crank out some great marketing. That is why you are here. And we are brought to you by the guys, the folk at Net Registry, who help you get your marketing sorted online. And as I've said before, and as I will say many times into the future, Anything in regards to domain name, registration, website hosting, website design and development, search engine optimization, social media design, you name it, Net Registry are set up to give you that online marketing love. So please go and check them out. Netregistry.com.au is where you will find them. Tell them Timbo sent you. And everyone, I would also like to give a big round of applause to those in the Flying Solo community who are also an important part of this show. Hey guys, I'm going to get straight into today. Um, I'm experiencing an incredibly exciting and busy time in my business. And today was one of those days where I've gone, oh, geez, can I find the time to put a show together? Of course I can find the time to put a show together, but it's going to be a show where we get stuck straight into our guest, which for some of you might be going, oh, thank God, he's not going to waffle. But hey, I hope I don't waffle, but it's all about sharing the marketing love. And uh, today, won't be doing any um, listener questions or forum updates or any of that stuff. I just want to get straight into the guest and get it out to you. Um, Now, listen in to this fellow's bio. The fellow I'm speaking to, his name is Matthew Michaelvitz. And in 2005, Matthew co-founded a business called Solve It IT, or Solve IT, I should say, software. And it's an Australian software company, which he grew from zero to 150 employees between 2005, 2012, and then he sold it for plenty. Under his leadership, however, Solvit became the third fastest growing company in Australia with a revenue growth of a lazy, wait for it, 678%. Um, So he's got a thing or two to share about starting a small business and growing it into a big one. He's also the book of a fan. He's also the book. He's also the author of a fantastic book. He is called Winning Credibility. And I'm going to talk to Matthew about how to win credibility as a small business owner. Matthew is also a speaker at the upcoming KPI, Key Person of Influence Conference in Sydney, which I am going to give you details of and a 40% discount too, um, where you can hear Matthew speak about getting your pitch right. Um, Key Person of Influence is also happening in Brisbane in August, Sydney in July. Um, Matthew's speaking at the Sydney one. Ian Elliott is speaking about pitching in at the Brisbane one, and Ian is also a guru pitch master. So either or, it's a good thing to do. Um, I'll talk more about that after the interview with Matthew. Suffice to say that we cover... So much interesting ground in this interview. Matthew talks about the importance marketing played in in building Solve IT. Solve it, uh, IT. It's hard to say. It's solve and then the words IT. So it's sort of solve it, solve it into all that type of stuff. But anyway, he talks about the importance marketing played in growing that business from nothing to really something. We talk about the pitching process. We talk about the importance of having confidence in business and purpose in business and, and so much more. He's a brilliant guy. I could have spoken to him for hours, but um, we kept it to around 30, 35 minutes because that's what we do on the show. So without further ado, here is my fireside chat with Matthew Michaelwitz. Matthew Michaelwitz, welcome to Small Business Big Marketing. Dear, thank you for having me, Tim. Pleasure to be on the show. <laughs> yeah, well, and I've got a big grin on my face because uh, your name was always going to trip me up. It was going to be Michael Matthewitz or Michael <laughs> Michael or I don't know. Well, I'm very happy you got it right. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Well, welcome. Now, um, before we get started into the serious stuff, what, what's your superpower? I reckon you might have a few, Matthew, but what's your superpower? I, I, I think if I had to name one, it'd be uh, the power of persuasion. So, uh, you know, everything. 
everything you do in life and business, you, you persuade, whether it's interviewing for a job, whether it's dating someone and convincing them to marry you, whether it's um, starting a business, you know, getting customers and so on. So persuasion is a, is a huge skill really required in life. And, and I think I've been pretty good at it. And so if I had to name one, that would be it. Interesting. I had previously a guest who was a leading expert out of New York on charisma. Um, I'm imagining charisma has a lot to do with persuasion. I've seen you. I've seen you uh, give a keynote speak. I, I saw you on YouTube last night. Um, what, what's your What's your trick behind being persuasive? I, I think you know a couple of things. You've always got to be sincere about what you do, and uh, you've got to be able to connect with people. So you know people are quick to. Uh, react to insincerity they can feel when someone isn't connected they're not paying attention to them they're not listening so being w- in whatever situation you're in connecting completely with that other person or audience uh, uh giving them the feeling that you've been in their shoes or you know what it's like and really showing them with sincerity w- what you're trying to do whether it's whatever you're trying to persuade them to, to action to take so i think it's the sincerity and really relating and connecting to the audience. I think that's really interesting because I literally met you 10 minutes ago on on the phone and when I ring um, a guest uh, and have that initial kind of establishing conversation before I hit record, sometimes, and we've never met before, sometimes, sometimes people can be standoffish. Um, you, you weren't. You, you knew, I, I, whether you'd thought about the position I'm in being the host of a show and whatever but you were i felt you're very approachable so clearly oh, that's a, it, it, i think that's a great skill i think like why not take the po- sometimes i think people take the negative and not the positive yes uh, approach you know initially yeah and, and plus you know to in business people do business with people they like so it's uh, it's it works against you to be negative to talk about negative things there's too much negativity in the world as it is and as a business person if you're going around and you know you're opening lines or you're uh, how's it going? Everything's negative. It it begins to work against you. So it's mm. you, you'll live longer, happier life. You'll do more business. You'll be more successful as a positive person because people mm. want to be around positive people. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. We're going to talk about the fact that you're a KPI speaker later on. But one of the things with the whole key person of influence training or course is that it is very positive. And I think the idea of surrounding yourself with positive people, particularly in small business, you know, like I know many of our listeners are are solopreneurs, you know, so you've got to you've got to draw on that positivity from somewhere. Absolutely. It's, It's tough. It's tough being an entrepreneur and it becomes impossible when you surround yourself with negative people mm. and you know, everyone's got a reason why you can't do something and that's probably why they don't do anything but surrounding yourself with people that can do support you that are positive open-minded it has a tremendous impact on success and that's been proven by a lot of studies that have been done in the field of psychology so it's mm. it's it's more than just uh you know uh, an observation it's something that's been studied and proven yeah yeah, interesting. Gosh, that's a com- that's an entire interview in itself. Yeah, right, that's, that's, that's my next book. Actually, it's coming out in October. So I did a really? lot of research uh, for it. It's around the psychology of success, and uh, it's a, it's an interesting field. But probably another interview, like you say. Well, you, have you got a name for it? I'm always yeah. It's called in- Life in Half a Second. Life in Half a Second. Yeah. No, no pressure there. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, okay. I thought I thought one minute was too long. So, uh. Oh wow, we live in a uh, we live in a world of well, it's it's a fast moving world. I didn't think it was that fast. Yeah, no, the, the the name comes from scaling down the time that the planet's been around four and a half billion years down to one year, yeah, right. and in the context of one year, human life is half a second. So wow. that's, that's that's where the name comes from. But uh, hey, I've got I've got a laugh, uh, Matthew. Um, we, I, I want to talk about Solve IT software, which yeah. you started in two thousand and two. Now, I, I'm guessing you're a bit of a, a technology IT. Well, maybe not, Boffin, because clearly you were the guy who started the business. But before we talk about how that grew, that had revenue growth of 678% in 2012 and was the third fastest growing company in Australia. Yep. Why on earth don't you have Skype? Uh, it's, it's a good question. So many people uh, think that I'm a, a technology geek because I ran Solvit and before Solvit, a company called New Tech, both of which uh, were companies that commercialized artificial intelligence technology, so very advanced technology. <laughs> yeah. so, so people look at that and say, oh, you should be on the bleeding edge. But really, my degree is in corporate finance. I don't code. I'm not a technologist. So I'm, I'm the person that really takes an idea and generates uh, value 
uh, revenues, profits from the technology. So my, I, I'm not passionate in the technology in the sense that I create it, I live it, it's my baby. I'm passionate about it in, in terms of the value it can create for customers. So I've got a completely different view on technology and, and, and hence my background really isn't programming or, or uh, developing software. It's finance and, and hence that's why I don't have Skype. It's, uh, it's, wow. it's, 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 it's not the thing that's close to my heart. Creating value and building a business is the thing that's really close to my heart. I, I find that really interesting because so often in small business, people, in fact, I was only talking to someone yesterday, they're in corporate life, they wanted to get out, start a small business around their passion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's like, okay, I get that, you know, follow your passion yep. and the money will come. You kind of, I guess, in a sense, you've followed your passion in that it's sort of corporate finance, setting up companies. Um, but it sounds to me like you could enter any industry as long as it played to your skill set of corporate, you know, build, doing the deal versus what the industry's about? Yeah, yeah, yes and no. So, I mean, at the beginning when I was in the university, uh, my passion was really fitness and my first business was a personal training business. And when I graduated from the university, I started a money management business with one of my customers from the fitness business, which was an investment banker. And we had about $150 million under management in that company, and we ended up selling it. And we got together into technology because my father had been a computer scientist for 30 years, had written 40 books on the subject, huh. and we found it was interesting what he was doing. So we saw an opportunity. On the definition of entrepreneurship is really you know, the process of identifying an opportunity, pulling the resources together, and, and beginning the execution process. So mm-hmm. that's how I viewed myself, and the passion was really around that whole process. You've got an idea, you see an opportunity in the market, no one's doing it. All of a sudden, you get all the pieces together and you start executing. That's what I've got the tremendous amount of passion for. And uh, and whether it's a technology business or it was in money management or in personal training, that's secondary to the actual passion of the building and starting and growing of a business. Yeah, okay. Interesting. Really interesting. I have a, a colleague of mine finds businesses that are under-marketed. He doesn't care what industry they're in, but as long as they're under-marketed, that's kind of his criteria for, for buying something and turning it around. Yeah, and, 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 you know, from experience, if I look at small businesses in general, and this is a sweep in generalization, people that are passionate about a specific field go and start a business, they follow their passion, mm. which means they're really good at something, whatever that something is. And what they're typically not good at is sales and marketing, because it's, it's you know, whether you're a computer programmer or whether you have a passion for developing websites or creative design or photography or whatever the case might be, mm-hmm. that is typically very separate from sales and marketing as a discipline and how you go and win business and, and so on. And that's why a lot of small businesses struggle because you could have the best product in the world, the best service. You could be absolutely number one. But if you don't know how to go and sell and win business and market properly, you lose to an inferior product that, that does know how. Well, let's talk about that. Solve it IT, solve it software, I should say. Fastest third, third fastest growing company in Australia in 2012. Yep. You sold it at that point. Tell me, what, what role did marketing play in getting you to that point? Oh, huge. Absolutely huge. So, I was hoping you'd say that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, and I, and I believe it. And before solve it in my previous businesses, the, the answer would be the same. Because, look, as, as a small business, you are up day one against established players that have more resources, more brand, customers, references. It's, it's always a David and Goliath story, which is what, what makes entrepreneurship exciting. So the question is, how do you beat Goliath? And it's, it's, it's not through a, the better product because no one knows about the product at the beginning. When you start, no one knows you. No, no one knows your name. So you've got to break through the noise. You've got to break through everything your competitors are doing, and that's marketing. Mm. And if you don't, you'll, no, you'll die before anyone hears about your great product or service. Mm. You, you, no, no, no one, so the role that marketing played was absolutely enormous. And, uh, and, and without it, We'd be another company that no one has ever heard of that, you know, plods along, has a growth, it does some interesting things, but flies below the radar and never has a successful outcome in the end. Yeah, and it's music to my ears to hear that. I'm currently doing a project for the city of Melbourne where I'm going inside 30 small businesses and rel- like I'm talking small, small businesses, and it's incredible how much they ignore marketing. They don't mean to. You know, the mm-hmm. guy I saw yesterday, he's just too busy. He's too busy for marketing, you know, and they're all too busy. But 
gosh, what? And then on the other side of the coin, it's not as if they're making a whole lot of dough. You yeah. know, so on one hand, they're, they're oh, I'll get to trouble here if any of them are listening. On one hand, they're whinging about, you know, gee, business is tough. Yep. Righto. Well, let's sit down and talk marketing. What yep. are you up to? And it's like, oh, well, you know, uh, not doing a lot. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's when people say they don't have time for marketing, that's basically a translation for saying, you know what, I don't have time to make bigger profits. I don't have time <laughs> to win customers. I don't have time to boot a successful business. I don't have time to, to, to really get known in the marketplace and increase my position and, uh, and branding. of It's crazy. It's absolutely mm. crazy if they, mm. it, because they really don't understand what they're saying when they say, I don't have time for marketing. It's incredible. What, what, yeah. In terms of marketing, I mean, again, it's such a broad term. For me, it's the quickest way to a sale. That's generally how I define it. What, what, uh, how do you define marketing and what were the kind of hype, the, the, the points that you hit uh, in the marketing of Solve It? Yeah, I, I look at marketing as people talk about sales and marketing and few people really understand the distinction between the two. So mm-hmm. marketing is everything happen, that happens before the sales conversation, mm-hmm. before the prospect contacts you for the first time. So marketing is successful when your phone rings, when you get a inquiry online. It's the sales conversation hasn't begun. And then you've got the whole sales process, which oh, is another, yeah. another discussion from the first conversation, how you represent your business and your value proposition, unique, you know, all of those kind of things to actually getting a customer. So I look at marketing and the success of marketing. Is it generating leads or people, is it generating awareness in the marketplace? Yep. And, uh, and, and one thing that uh, marketing leads to is obviously credibility. The more you're out there, the more uh, people write about you in the media, online, television appearances, the more visibility you have the more credibility the business has, and it's easier to sell with a business that's well-known than a business that no one's ever heard of before. That's obvious as well. So if we go back to marketing, the things that really worked around the marketing side were things that generated visibility and credibility for the business. So Mm -hmm. within Solvit, we created a national event uh, that was in the area of what our business provided, which was integrated planning and optimization. Five, six hundred people attended. It was one of the biggest uh, two, three day events in Australia in the field of supply chain. We had every major miner there, all the ports, the rail companies. We had our partners there like Schneider Electric, which ended up buying the business later. And at that event, you see all of the customers look at one another. The prospects look at you know all of the people that are there. It provides a great credibility. The media covers it, so you get visibility. And then that leads to business. So all of a sudden, you're positioning yourself as a leader, as a company that look at all of our customers, our customers presented at the event. So see, I always look at marketing. Will it generate visibility? Is this going to generate reach? Are people going to hear about it, read about it, see it? And is it going to develop credibility for my business and what we're trying to provide? So the events were absolutely fantastic. And things like uh, building board of advisors or board of directors with high-profile people that uh, the media is going to cover and uh, and its credibility by association. Can, can I just um, – that, that event strategy, Matthew, did, was that – like early days, was it? Like was that year one, year two slash? No, no, no. we've we've ran events, but and uh, and the initial ones were smaller. We ran South Australian right. events. We picked topics that were relevant, uh, like uh, optimizing business processes or improving productivity, things that are even topical today. Mm-hmm. And uh, and you run events on it, and you want to position yourself as a thought leader on the subject. But you, again, you want to generate visibility, have the media there invite journalists and so forth, make sure they cover the event, interview some of your customers so you get visibility. And at the same time, you get credibility because you're positioning yourself as a thought leader. Customers present on your behalf at some of these events. So always in marketing, I look at those two things. Will it give me reach? Will it make me look good from a credibility point of view and uh, and make the business look bigger, stronger, uh, more powerful than it previously did? Interesting strategy. I mean, we, we live in such an online world today, and even I reflect on the show on the recent episodes of Small Business Big Marketing. We talk a lot about content marketing. There's a lot of talk around online marketing, which is valid because with small businesses, many have modest budgets. Online marketing yeah. does provide a lot of opportunities, but taking it offline, I mean, crazy idea, bringing people together shaking hands but you know um having that putting on events is is it almost feels like an underutilized strategy these days 
Yeah, and, and, you know, I agree with your comments about everything being online, but you've got to also appreciate that it depends on what the size of what you're selling. So if your transaction size, average deal size is $100 or $50 or $1,000, that that's going to be more better suited for online marketing and an online marketing strategy versus a business where the average deal size is a million dollars. No, no one buys anything online for a million dollars. So you could have the best online strategy, but all that's going to do is generate potentially some leads. You have content on there. It's mm. always going to be the face-to-face -face interactions on the bigger deals that sell. Mm. So, the, so the, the higher value of what you sell, that, the higher the average deal size, the more well-suited that is for events and getting people together because people make big decisions when you look into someone's eyes, shake their hands, talk to them, get to know them. Is this someone I can trust? Is this someone that's going to take care of me? Those, those things are never going to go away on high-value purchases irrespective of how online the world gets. It's yeah. always going to come down to the handshake when you're spending a million dollars. People buy from people. Absolutely, from people they like. <laughs> people they like, yeah, exactly right. <laughs> hey, I might add that to my uh, little quote these days. Uh, yeah. Thanks to Matthew. Hey, Matthew, you, one, a, a quote that I love of yours is um, more than half of new businesses fail within five years. We all know that. Many of those that endure can't seem to bridge the gulf between just surviving and true success. What I want to yeah. know, what what stops them bridging that gulf? Yeah, it, it, it always comes down to sales and marketing. So my view of small businesses is that they, especially the ones that are services based. And when you're when you're running a service based business, you have a certain amount of capacity to do stuff, and that's typically defined in human hours. So mm. in a year, how many human hours do you have available? And if you sell all of them you're at maximum capacity, and if you sell too little, you're underutilizing too much, you, you don't have capacity. Now, what ends up happening is because small businesses are weak in sales and marketing, generally speaking, they end up not being able to fill the capacity that they have. So say they have 100 hours in the year that they can sell, just as a hypothetical number, mm -hmm. they're only able to sell 50 or 60. So they're in a panic. How do I sell my remaining capacity? They discount they, uh, they revert to special deals. If you pay early, we'll give you 15% because they're, they're trying to sell that capacity. And what ends up happening, it keeps them in this mode of survival it, 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 because you're never able to break out of it because you're never able to increase your profits, hire better people, invest in proper sales and marketing. You, you're stuck in this loop. So the, the thing to break out of that is basic supply and demand economics. You have to get your business to the point where the demand for your product exceeds the capacity that you have as a business. So if you have 100 hours for sale, if, if people want to buy 200 hours, instead of doubling your capacity and continuing to struggle, you need to raise the price. And some of the people will fall off. They'll say, I can't afford the higher price. That's okay. But the people or businesses that do buy at the higher price now give you a higher profit, which you can reinvest in the business and people and sales and marketing and other things that you need. So I, I see this perpetual uh, loop, which can last years, if not decades, of people just struggling to fill their capacity by discounting and never able to get to the point where demand exceeds supply and they can raise the price and all of a sudden increase profits. And to do that is sales and marketing. It's not a better oh, product. It's not more innovation. It's sales and marketing. So let's just get really clear there. Um, create the demand so that you can't s service it. In order to service it, you raise your price so people Correct. drop off. Yes. I I'm guessing generally people drop off. It's a good filter like that, you know, the ones who can't yes. afford you are the ones that you don't. You may necessarily not want to deal with. Yes. And um, up, up she goes. Well, it, it think, think, yeah, think of it this way, Tim. Do you want to have... Uh, you know, a hundred customers that are paying you ten dollars for some type of service, or would you know, would you rather have fifty customers, half the customers, but instead of them paying you twenty dollars, they pay you thirty? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's less customers. You can provide better service. It's more. Everything's more personalized, and you make more profit in the end. Mm. And I think you know, and small business people are confused. They think this is the price point. Um, more customers is is always better. They increase their fixed costs. Now they've got more uh, costs that they need to cover. They're in a panic. The economy goes down. Things uh, don't go according to plan. They start discounting. And then they get stuck in that loop. So, 
you have to oversubscribe. You have to get your demand to exceed your capacity of your business to make a valuable business and to start making real money. What, what about the idea of just incre- adding the, the amount of hours you have to offer by employing more people? Yeah, I mean, the, what ends up happening is that typically that is the small business response. They, they, they do something in sales and marketing, and they it, it, demand does exceed supply. They run an event. They have an online strategy. Uh, they generate a referral or loyalty program, and all of a sudden demand spikes. And instead of raising the price at that point, which is the thing that would make them financially successful, they instead increase their capacity. They increase their supply. And then they're back to where they were before. And possibly even in a worse situation, because if demand goes backwards in the future, now you've got a higher fixed cost that you need to cover. Mm. So in, in all the businesses that I've ran, I always ran them on the philosophy that once I sell my capacity, the next deal I do is going to be at a much higher price point. And if I lose the next deal, that's okay, because I've got all my capacity covered. It's already sold. But if I win that next deal and have to increase my capacity, I'm going to make much more profit than I made before. And in Solvit, when we grew, we were systematically increasing the prices. Our first deals for our software were 100000 200000 The last deals that I did before selling the business were 4 $5 million dollars. So you, you imagine if my whole business growth strategy was just selling more deals at two hundred thousand dollars, well, I'd never get anywhere. Never get yet. anywhere. Mm. Never. I'd be struggling. Yeah. That that whole aspect of marketing, which is price, uh, I know, sends a shiver up many of my listeners' um, spines. And I'm yet to find a pricing expert to bring on the show and have that kind of detailed discussion. Um, what what is the what's my question here? Is it one of mindset? What's the mindset that you have when you get to that capacity and you say the next deal you're going to do, you are going to offer it at a significantly increased price? How do you decide on that number? Now, I don't expect you to kind of detail the formula or anything, but what's that mindset that you've got to have to say I'm going to charge a whole lot more for what I do? Yeah, a, a extremely good question. Just to preface that question, if pricing experts get it wrong systematically. So if you look at some of the, uh, whether it's for uh, Apple and the launch of the iPhone, whether you look at even products at McDonald's, established multi-billion dollar companies get this thing wrong. So it's not that a small business just doesn't have access to the right person. It's a very, very difficult area. So to your question, what kind of mindset do you need to have? If you're, Say you're at that point, you've sold all your capacity, now's the time you're going to increase prices. The way I've always looked at the next deal where I'm going to increase price is is two factors. One, is it a deal that if I don't get the higher price, I'm happy to lose? So that's important, and that's very important in technology because sometimes, like winning BHP, say BHP is the next deal, that's not a customer you can afford to lose because it will give you credibility, visibility, and all of these other things. So if it's a customer that you can afford to lose, that ticks the box and say, okay, I'm going to increase the price. And the second criteria is, do I have a relationship with this prospect where I can test the boundaries of what I'm going to price at? So uh, selling bigger ticket items, I develop relationships with prospective customers. And in developing the relationships, I knew that when I put a price on the table, justified it, showed the hours, the license fees, and so on, I knew that if they couldn't buy they would come back and tell me. There'd be a negotiation process. It wouldn't be, yes, uh, I'm going to do it, or no, forget it, let's have a look at the next vendor. So it gave me this um, uh, uh, area of almost elasticity where, where I could go and test different pricing ranges because I knew the relationship had been developed to a point where they could push back and I could push forward and we could negotiate something and it wouldn't be just an arbitrary yes-no decision. Mm. Yeah, I love that. And, and even, Tim, in my first business, which is a personal training business, and I was selling packages for a few hundred dollars versus a few million dollars, so on the other, completely other spectrum of the scale, mm. the same thing applied. I've only got a certain amount of hours that I can work. I've got to sleep. I've got to eat. I've got to drive to work. And that leaves X hours where I can actually train people. So say I decide I'm going to sell half of those hours at some rate that, that you know, I can survive. Mm-hmm. The next half I want to sell at a higher rate. 
And then once I start to start hiring people and so on, then I'm going to double the rate. Now, in moving up that pricing spectrum, the, the best way to make sure you succeed is develop some form of relationship with the prospect. So if someone's interested in personal training and I develop a relationship with them, even if it's over a few hours and you send them some emails and some articles, you do a follow-up call, you know at that point, having spent the time with that person, that if the price is too high, chances are they'll just come back and say, look, this is too high. Is there anything you can do for me? It's not going to be that they're going to tell you to get lost or you're going to say, no, let me look at another trainer. So really the mindset around being in that pricing conversation, is the relationship good enough at that early stage where if, they, if you give them a too high price, they can push back and you can enter a negotiation process? Yeah, I love that. That whole it, it, people want to feel value, and that value may come through the form of a relationship. It may come the fo- through the form of you know exchange of emails where you, you're sharing your knowledge. And we've talked a lot on this show Absolutely. about content marketing. Um, and then, I mean, giving the people the ability to feel as though they can have that discussion around price is great because if you've just got that, I guess that cold that the cold relationship, then it's so much easier for them to just say, "No, nah, I'll move on." Yeah. But Absolutely, Tim. And in, in sales, if you if you get proper sales training, they will teach you to build an emotional connection with the prospect. Even if you're selling a car, get the person emotionally connected with the product. Get them to drive the car, sit in the car, listen to the stereo, listen to the sound of the engine. Mm. And and the, the greater that emotional connection, the relationship with the salespeople, the, the easier it is to have a pricing conversation rather than you've got no relationship, no attachment, you put a price on the table because there's no relationship or attachment, they say no. Mm. And you haven't even learned anything from that. Well, well, I did it with this interview. I mean, my, my question up front, um, and I, I don't always do it, but my, asking you what's your superpower is just a way of allowing, I think, both of us to relax into a conversation, which was always going to move into you know a more of a business slash marketing discussion. Yeah. So yeah. something, um, I, I was ahead of you. I, I was, I've already ticked that box. <laughs> but I love it. I, I learned that from a um, – there was a wonderful show on Australian TV years ago called The Panel where they used to – they'd bring on guests, you know, there might be, you know, Hugh Jackman maybe in Australia to talk about his next big film and he'd, he'd arrive on set and, you know, instead of instead of the first question being, so, Hugh, tell us about, you know, the, your film, which would be the ex- obvious question, they'd just ask some completely uh, random question that just kind of settled everything down into a conversation engaging manner. Yes, I, I agree with that approach, yep. So now, um, Matthew, uh, you, you've written this wonderful book, Winning Credibility. You are running the pitching section of a session of a key person of influence course in Sydney and Melbourne uh, in the coming weeks, and I'll give details to that. Winning Credibility, One, I, I'm guessing... I'm guessing that one of the first steps to winning credibility is getting your pitch right. So when someone says, hey, what do you do? You've got an engaging answer. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm almost of the philosophy that life is a pitch. You know, if everything <laughs> you say pitch is, or uh, that was a, a pitch, pee. A pitch, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Whether, whether it's uh, applying for a job, whether it's starting a business, getting a customer, an investor on board, everything comes down to this, you know, the ability to concisely being able to pitch whatever. A wife. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So I, I think there's also a lot of overlap and that's why the relationship between myself and key person of influence is a great fit because what I wrote in winning credibility is perfectly aligned with key person of influence, mm. build visibility, build credibility, uh, get a better standing in the marketplace and through that, that's going to be easier to market what you do. You'll be able to sell at a higher price point, and you'll have more incoming leads that make mm-hmm. it an easier and more lessful sales, sales conversation. So the, the topic of the book and what is presented in the program is very similar. All right. Well, I, I, where, can you give us the pitching, pitching's silver bullet? Well, the, the silver bullet is in, in pitching is to have a – and keep in mind that – uh, there are different types of pitches from yes. the elevator where you, you, you've got uh, 30 seconds to tell someone what you do. All the That's way a slow when, elevator. Yeah, it could be. We're a big building. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, went, I went to the top of the tallest building in the world two weeks ago in Dubai, and that was um, it was nine metres a second. So um, Wow. Yeah, yeah, wow. you want to get your pitch right in that. Um, no, no, no. The, the, I used to be in the Sears Tower, and uh, the elevator there was much slower than that. So there was uh, a cool okay. minute to... 
to, to get to the top. But let's let's talk about. Um, so there are various pitches. So you've got your Correct. elevator pitch through to to, to really a, a, a formal sales pitch where you're yeah. actually trying to close business. So and and there's two things that are that are important. One um, is the objective of each pitch. This is where people go horribly wrong. So. So they, they think that the objective of every pitch is to win business or, or, or get a sale or a customer, which is absolutely wrong. The objective of every pitch is to get you to the next stage. That's the only objective. So if you're in an elevator, the only objective you could possibly have in pitching to someone or telling them about your business is to get to the next stage, which would be really evaluation or uh, send me some information. Let's have a discussion about benefits and so on. And then from that pitch, it would be something more formal. But every pitch has to have an objective of the next stage. It's like sending your resume in for a job. Your resume isn't going to get you the job. What's, what Your resume is a pitch for what? For an interview. Mm-hmm. Right? And the first interview might be an hour interview, and the whole pitch in that interview is to get you to a formal full-day interview. So in pitching, you have to be clear about your objective, and people don't walk into meetings or presentations with a clear objective. When I say to a business owner, okay, you're going to go into XYZ meeting, what's your objective? Tell me what, you, what is going to make that meeting a success or that pitch a success. Mm-hmm. And often they can't tell you, so they walk into pitches without having clearly in their mind what the objective of the pitch is. Mm. So that's problem one. And then the second problem is really being clear. It's the, you know, you, the, the, the old question, what do you do, has an enormous amount of answers that are undigestible to the general public. They have no idea what it means. Yeah. They, 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 they listen, you know, they like, whether it's in the elevator or in uh, a formal setting, they use fancy terms, they try to convince, they try to persuade, they do all of these things, and in the end, it's really not even clear what is it that you do, what's the value proposition, how is it relevant to me, so on. Those are crucial items. And if, and if I, you know, going back, what's the magic bullet or the silver bullet? Mm-hmm. It'd be a pitch that is so simple, so exciting, and so compelling that when you tell that pitch to someone, they go and tell other people in the exact same way you presented it because it's so exciting. And it's so yeah. simple they can repeat it. And th- th- that's what happened at Solve It. We, we did something exciting. We pitched people, and they thought it was so exciting, they told all their friends and other colleagues about it in the exact same way that we pitched it. Well, you mentioned so many things there. Like, if you if you can't if you the business owner can't be excited about it, then who can be? Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Simple language. I, I think you know it's a classic example of referral marketing. You need to you need to tell people if there's people out there referring your business, God bless them. But you need to explain to them how to pitch your business. So the idea yes. of putting it in simple language, I think, is brilliant. I think the idea of having an objective is just just damn well obvious. And I'll add to that. And correct me if I'm wrong, but having that objective and having Having the desired outcome, you know, what's the in marketing communications, you know, for advertising or direct marketing, or whatever it is, we talk about, you know, what's the desired outcome we're looking for. So, mm-hmm. when when you're pitching to someone, if you know that, you know, okay, um, if I get an opportunity to speak to that person, really, what I want them to do is walk away and tell someone else who yep. you know I know they know. Um, having that desired outcome in mind surely m- can be of massive use. And and, and I, I, I've pitched you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of times in the businesses that I've had, and, and when you're selling something high value, the, the purpose of uh, once you're in the door and you're actually doing formal pitches might be to get to a decision maker. Mm. So it's not to actually convince someone there to buy anything. It's to, it, it's a, so the objective is critical, because if you mm. walk into a gatekeeper and you're pitching them to buy a product, they're not even, they can't buy. They're not even a buyer in the organization. Your objective is to get through the gatekeeper to get to the buyer or to the decision maker. So Mm. objectives are key. And and the one thing that I'll add above all of these, which is where Winning Credibility, the book came out of, is you could be clear, you could be passionate, you could have absolutely crystal objectives around what you want to achieve, and you can still fail in the end because what you offer and your business just aren't credible. Mm. And when I was in the United States, the software business I had before Solve It, we were already a significant business. We had 100 employees. We had raised venture capital. I was the CEO. We had productized uh, technology for optimizing transportation networks. 
We had Ford Motor Company and General Motors at customers. So we, were, we, were, we thought we were on our way. And I went and pitched to the head of logistics at Bank of America and said this is how we could save a lot of money in your transportation network and so on. And the pitch failed. And they said, look, you're, you, you, you might think you're a big company, but you're a rounding error in Bank of America's uh, bank account. That's how they're, they're sort of a trillion-dollar organization by the, the largest bank in the U.S. Mm. They don't deal with companies like that for mission-critical software, and they, mm. they told us to get lost. And it was a, maybe a year later, where through a, a, a very long process, which I won't bore you on the show, I managed to pitch the CEO and chairman of Bank of America that had just retired after 20 years to come and join my board of directors and invest in my company. He agreed. And then, all of a sudden, Bank of America was a customer two months later with the same product. With this, And, and, and so I, I learned from that experience, you could have a great product, you could be clear, you could have great objectives, you could be passionate, you know, just on fire with, uh, with passion. But if you're not credible, if you walk in to whoever you're pitching and they look at you and, and say, who, who are you? You're not online, I've never heard of you before. If you're not credible, your pitch will fail. And that's where the book Winning Credibility came from and that whole experience at Bank of America where everything was the same except credibility. Credibility changed and then my ability to pitch and win business changed on the instant as well. Love it. Well, listeners, um, I am talking to Matthew Michaelwitz, and he is the author of Winning Credibility. He's also speaking at the Key Person of Influence event in Sydney and Brisbane in July and August. Uh, I'll put the dates. Do you know the dates off the top of your head, Matthew? I know July 6th. July 6th in Sydney. 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 Yes, that's the next one. Yeah, and then there's one in Brisbane. I'll put the dates uh, on the show notes. But honestly, guys, I mean, I've been through the key person of influence process. And uh, if what you heard Matthew talk about then is of interest, I'm guessing you're going to go into a lot more detail with the pitching process. Absolutely. Matthew. So, guys, get along. It's golden. And we've all got to get our pitch right. Matthew, thanks so much for being a part of the Small Business Big Marketing Show. Hugely appreciated. A pleasure, Tim. Thank you for having me. Well, guys and girls, I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I did bringing it to you. I could have spoken to Matthew about so many different aspects of business and marketing and probably would have gone for three or four hours, but we might get him back on in months to come, maybe when he brings out his next book. Three learnings I got from that fireside chat, um, generating visibility, great mindset to have when starting uh, out a small business and wanting to get it seen and heard. Number two, be clear on the objective of your pitch. Why are you pitching something? Is it to get the sale? Is it to get the meeting? Is it to generate more inquiry? Is it to get someone to talk about your business to someone else? Being clear on your pitch objective sounds like a smart thing to do because as Matthew said... Life's a pitch. And number three, that whole pricing strategy mindset of, um, you know, getting demand, outstripping supply, and then putting your price up. Um, Sounds easy, and getting demand to outstrip supply is the hard bit. That's where marketing comes in, and I think Matthew shared some great stuff around that. Now, guys... um, Matthew is speaking in Sydney at the Key Person of Influence Conference. Uh, Now, let me see. The date of that is 6th of July. So it's coming up. There's also a Key Person of Influence event in Brisbane at the 31st of August. It's 2013, by the way, because podcasts have a bit of a habit of being listened to uh, forever and a day. So you may be listening to this in the future and those dates have passed. But if you do, if you are in Sydney or Brisbane and or can get there, I really encourage you to go there. If you go to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com and go to episode 143, you will find a link to get you a 40% discount uh, for attending the event. And look, I've been to a couple of those events. I've been through the key person of influence process it's excellent. Okay, it is excellent. If you've got any questions about it, feel free to post them in the show notes for episode 143 or send me um, just a question or voicemail through the contacts page of smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. All right, guys, um, I'm going to love you and leave you. I reckon there's plenty of there, to, plenty of stuff there to go on with. Get out there and action it. I was saying it on my deep dive mastermind call this morning with my guys that action's everything, you know. Um, We can talk and think about our marketing for as long as we want to, but until we take action, um, it's all just kind of, you know, 
It's not real. And like I could have not put that the episode together this morning that I'm doing right now. But you know what? It's not as hard as we think it is. A lot of this marketing stuff, you know, uh, get out there and do it. I know you're busy. I know budgets are limited, but take action and you will be rewarded. That's my little rant for the end of this episode. Love your work. May your marketing be the best marketing. See you next week. You've been listening to the Small Business Big Marketing Show with Tim Reid. Want more marketing goodness? Then visit smallbusinessbigmarketing.com.